What's up everyone? This is Darius Kalbarczy, co-founder of NGPO and JSPO and AngularMastery.dev and WorkshopFest.dev. Welcome back to the JavaScript Master Podcast. Today we've got a special guest from Warsaw, Poland, independent consultant, software architect, speaker, trainer and co-founder of Architectura na Froncie. Ladies and gentlemen, Tomasz Ducin. Hi, Tomasz. How are you? Hi, Darek. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to the podcast. For those who don't know you yet, please tell us about yourself. Uh, my name is Tomasz, as you know. I'm an architect and a consultant, and a better consultant. I've been working in the industry since uh, 2007 and have experience in various area of technologies, uh, starting with Java, Python, also a little bit of PHP and C++. And since over a decade, I'm mostly like, I've dived into uh, the JavaScript ecosystem. And um, I've been working as a, as a uh, just a developer, team lead, architect. And right now uh, I'm doing consultancy for uh, smaller and bigger companies. Uh, I do audits. I basically help teams to overcome the uh, limitations or the obstacles and uh, from time to time I also do uh, development trainings. You suggested the title of this podcast episode You Don't Know TypeScript that sounds similar to famous You Don't Know JS box. Is that coincident? Uh, yes, that's a deliberate coincidence. So when I do consultancy and I cooperate with multiple teams in you know multiple uh, projects I see that what seems kind of enough in understanding on most of the people is basically a very basic and very limited understanding on not only how TypeScript works, but also what does it provide? And first and foremost, what are the, let's say, compile time errors or runtime errors that basically TypeScript enables people to get rid of? And the fact that People are not aware of such possibilities that they often don't think about certain error that they want to, uh, let's say, uh, limit. And they do not think about, okay, so I'm going to use a certain technique in order to basically solve the problems that I might be having anyway. So um, I have a feeling that most of the of the developers I, I got to got to know, got to meet, uh, are basically um, um, satisfied with using just interfaces, just using, you know, primitive types, and that's basically it. Like, from time to time, also a little bit of generics, but uh, there's just, you know, a beginning of a long journey where you can actually use the language as a tool to uh, to provide better type safety, not only for you today, right here, right now, but also for other developers which will join your project so that they will make less mistakes providing that like that's kind of obvious but when somebody joins a new project they don't know what kind of mistakes they could make because they don't have the context that that you've had when you've been writing the code so we could leverage the 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 language of the tool to basically make it more difficult to make a mistake and this is the, you know, a very broad aspect that I see people are missing. Yeah, it has the, hence the title I suggested, uh, you don't know TypeScript. Maybe it should be called, you don't know TypeScript enough. Can you tell us what are the major issues you see when you're doing project audits and consultancy when it comes to TypeScript? Vast majority of the project that asked me for uh, for some help basically used use types uh, types of interfaces and times, and that's basically uh, that, that that's basically it. People do not think about what is the let's say area in which a certain type should be available. People uh, often put types in basically you know a global directory, and they kind of they don't see any issue with that. Um, they're missing like, you know, some kind of um, a skill to predict how could the project evolve in in multiple, in, in upcoming years, like 
uh, what like not only you know the the language itself, but also the design that stand that stands behind your uh, your your code. People are often missing uh, the knowledge about type compatibility. For instance, quite often I see people using uh, the object type top object with uh, the uppercase O, and they're absolutely surprised when they see that you can basically assign just a number like number five assigned to object with the uppercase o and they're kind of like what is going on here and well yeah this is like this has to be supported because typescript has to you know make uh, uh the whole point of typescript is to make using javascript more type safe, but it cannot change the semantics of, of JavaScript. And in JavaScript, we've got, like in many other languages as well, boxing and uh, auto boxing and auto unboxing. So if you have a you know primitive five, it can be upcasted, boxed into object version of five. So you have all the methods of the object um, prototype. And it's so uh, all the primitives are um, compatible with object except for just null and undefined. And, you know, like, imagine you didn't know that, and you basically put uppercase object into, you know, 20 or 50 places. Like, you're never going to have enough time to basically go through that back again. Uh, Or, uh, instead of using uh, unknown in multiple places, people just don't know what to put, so... They think, oh, I could run this function over everything, so I'm going to put any. Or um, people have like you know only the basic understanding on how to use generics. You know, just putting one t uh, in front, uh, just in front of the function, and using a t as a parameter, and that's basically it. So uh, there is a lot more to it. Um, moreover, people coming from backend technologies like Java or C sharp um, somehow correctly and somehow incorrectly assume that TypeScript will work or will like, you know, reflect how how uh, how their languages uh, are going to work. And that's not necessarily true um, because, for instance, when you create uh, same interfaces just with different names in Java or C Sharp, they're not going to be compatible by uh, default. Uh, like, unless you put any... Um, um, like relation between them, that one is going to extend the other, etc. And in TypeScript, TypeScript doesn't care about where your types come from, right? So you could think that you are actually preventing making a mistake, and completely you're not. <laughs> so that's the issue. Uh, issue I see. Of course, it depends on whether you are, you know, coming from a background, uh, backend background, or frontend background. But these are really. Um, uh, like um, like the issues that that I see uh, quite often, and one more is like absolute abuse of using type assertions. You know the expression as and the type you provide. So you know something basically you're trying to calculate something, you get wrong results. So you just put as like shut up the compiler, just listen to what I say. <laughs> I know better than you. Most often you don't, but you're ch- you're kind of you know brute forcing the compiler. So you know instead of just understanding what is going on, people are just satisfied. Okay, ass, and here you go. The compiler is happy. Like you know, like how could you trust a tool that uh, that the whole point of the tool is to provide you type safety if you're kind of you know brute forcing the tool to listen to you? Like no, that's that's not the way, right? So yeah, and. During the trainings and the, my consultancy, people ask pretty basic questions. So, like, I mean, I'm there to help them. But my general uh, feeling is that the you know the the understanding of TypeScript, like in in the community in general, is rather basic. So, um, I think there is a lot a uh, lot of work that could be done in this area. What are the benefits of using TypeScript in large scale enterprise projects? Are there any challenges for big apps to be aware of? Oh, sure. Um, I think the the bigger the project is and the more challenging the project is, it uh, it makes more sense uh, to to enhance TypeScript. So yeah, there would be quite a lot of them. So um, the 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 main benefit is actually like providing like 
in big uh, big scale app, um, enterprise projects, you're going to probably have lots of developers, probably multiple teams, uh, maybe even working in different, not only locations, because locations are not a problem, uh, because we can you know easily uh, communicate uh, remotely, but in different time zones. Uh, I had uh, experience working in two projects which were split into various time zones. One of the projects had uh, kind of 20 teams, like one, maybe one product, not one project, one product that consisted of multiple projects, but we've been, um, you know, we've had um, uh, like a, a very big and complex pipeline to deploy the product, etc. And we've had to, you know, communicate uh, with uh, like other teams from Europe, with teams from the West Coast, with teams from the East Coast, uh, with teams from Australia, China, and India. So that was kind of pretty much all time zones around the world you can you can think of. And it, it's very challenging. Like if you want to um, have just a uh, gathering of the architects let's say front end architects of of the of the product like there is not a single point uh during the day when there is not you know uh there is no just a middle of the night and the question is how do you communicate and the whole point of uh type shift in, in, in such a way is to provide like um what are your intentions when you write something what is the area in which something should be used how that should be used like what is public, what is private, like provide encapsulation. So um, think very carefully about how do, you, how do you want the consumer, the user, like the developer of a certain thing to use, use it and basically um, make it explicit with types. So uh, in big um, enterprise projects, I would say that the most important things is to separate what is going to be private within your uh, piece of work, what is going to be public. And since something is public, many other places in the product and the company might be using it. And within time, like something that th there is one certain thing, or maybe not three certain things in life, uh, death, taxes, and the fact that your public API is going to change, right? And if a different team starts using your public API, and you want to change it after a while, you have to, you know, communicate to plan the change because you're going to introduce a breaking change. So maybe they do have some capacity to um, to basically jump to the to the new one. Uh, maybe you can, um, you know, just apart from having the old API, provide a new API so that when they have time, they would basically shift to the new one. But if they don't have time, if they don't have the capacity, and you would like to basically drop the maintenance of the old one, now this is going to be challenging. So TypeScript is basically becoming just a tool to think about the design. But the thing is, if you don't have explicit types, um, you don't have, you know, an explicit reason to start thinking about your, your design. So TypeScript is just a language in which you declare the most important things in your model in your architecture so uh it just makes it more um more like uh, more obvious that the design between teams across different modules is is very important so i would say providing contracts defining intentions thinking about um about what should be actually available to to other folks or um whether you import or export something from a certain file actually explicitly makes a dependency, right? So um, you could be using tools like NX, for instance, where you can actually see, for instance, uh, across a model repo, uh, you, you can generate a graph where you can actually see the dependencies of the things, right? So using using the um, the, the, the proper line, uh, the, the proper tools, you can actually visualize your architecture. And if you've got too many edges across certain nodes in such a dependency graph, you can basically see, oh, we, we are heading towards a spaghetti architecture. So we should clean up our architecture, right? And the fact that, for instance, you provide a function that you place in a, or an object in a, in a wrong place that many other things are using this could be already a you know a sign that that something is is going wrong and um there is also a um 
a benefit of using TypeScript that actually the model, like types and interfaces, like not only classes, but also just the, the, the types, the interfaces, they become a first class citizen of a system so that you can track the dependencies. If you didn't have them, that would be kind of like they would exist kind of, you know, implicitly, but they could be tracked and now they're explicit. For instance, uh, when using state machines, just using TypeScript unions, you define that, okay, I've had my model in mind that I'm going to switch from one state to another state, that I'm going to clear a property on a TypeScript interface. But if you don't write down the types, it's going to be very difficult for another developer who would basically maintain your code further. It would be very difficult to find out that, okay, you've had this design in mind. And the, the just the fact that you are writing down the interfaces makes it clear that, okay, there is a whole, you know, um, uh, understanding. There is a, you know, whole, uh, like, uh, like the, all the things that you've taken into account to basically craft the, the model, craft the shape, right? So, uh, it's way easier for other folks by reading your types, uh, get to know, like, what did you mean? What did you want to achieve and what issues potentially you wanted to uh to prevent right uh also um one thing uh that is quite important when people think about like you know introducing typescript into a project or improving the types of that they already have um quite a misconception is that typescript is not going to you know um it's not necessarily going to help you today because most often when you write typescript code TypeScript might, um, you know, throw compilation errors, which might be kind of irritating from time to time. Like some of the errors are irritating, but anyway, like we shall not think in terms, you know, fighting TypeScript, like, you know, just, just, uh, dear compiler, just shut up, just, you know, make the error silent. I don't want to see it. I just want the code to compile. No, the fact that the compiler is actually complaining about something I consider it actually as a good idea because I'm doing something that is either something that the compiler cannot understand. So how could it help me in the future, right? If it cannot understand it or that I am breaking my own rules. So how could I expect type safety if I'm breaking something that either the tool cannot understand or I'm breaking my own assumptions from the past? And the thing is, TypeScript is not going to help me right here, right now. TypeScript is going to help the future me or the future developers who will maintain the code. So we should think of it as an investment. And now, when does it make sense to use TypeScript? Like, if you see that your project is going to, you know, live uh, for many years or by many different people that don't know the code yet, but they will have to uh, get familiar with it. Like, this is the, the whole point. Don't think about TypeScript like the tool that is going to speed you today. No, it's not going to speed you today. It's an investment. And um, yeah, so you also asked, what are the challenges? So I would say like lack of all the things that I've said. So if you're not doing the design first, so you're starting with the implementation, TypeScript is going to be an obstacle. But the whole point is that you're trying to implement, if you're trying to implement something that you don't yet know, what is it going to be? Probably you should be, you should basically stick to dynamic, like the dynamically typed languages. Uh, like just JavaScript, but if you want to, you know, uh, produce something with big scale, well, design is the the first and the most important thing that you should you should start with. Uh, you should um, avoid creating uh, global types as much as possible. Uh, even if something relates to global objects, everything should be modularized because the worst thing that could happen is basically too many dependencies across a code across a code base that become difficult to track so this is something that could basically spoil the project and make it you know pain in the ass to basically uh work with so not thinking about the dependencies not thinking about the release cycles uh like the lack of um of you know um uh, like figuring out how could a project change and finally uh, picking, like doing the wrong abstraction. Uh, maybe maybe our listeners uh, are familiar with uh, very good writing by Sandy Metz. 
about wrong abstraction. Basically, if you have two things that look similar, for instance, um, mm -hmm. you have, let's say, a bike that has, uh, well, I know, uh, two wheels, and you have a motorcycle that has two wheels, and you have yet another machine that has two wheels, right? Oh, perhaps you could have an, a small airplane that just have two wheels only when you land or when you want to take off, right? Just two wheels. And they create a you know, category of two-wheel vehicles. They're completely different, right? But you just want to get a certain trait that is common, that is shared by them into, uh, let's say, into just one piece of reusable functionality. And by this metaphor, what I mean... Um, you just take, I don't know, a couple of uh, lines of code that are basically copied, or in terms of TypeScript, a couple of properties that you define on a type, and you are very eager to reuse them. So reusability, uh, like lack of reusability is bad, but over reusability is also bad. <laughs> so. Uh, dear everybody, if you basically see that, oh, you would have two interfaces or two types sharing some of the properties, it's not necessarily, it's like, it's not always a good idea to extract the common part because you might be doing wrong abstraction, just not going to, you know, uh, get deeper uh, into it. But uh, again, recommend the, the, the writing and the presentations by Sandy Mess. Uh, she's diving into the topic very, very well. What are the key differences between TypeScript and other statically typed languages like Java or C Sharp? I mentioned that um, some backend oriented developers who um, implement TypeScript um, do have some, let's say, uh, challenges when it comes to like figuring out what are the key differences. So, of course, there are um, differences in the, fee the, the, the syntax, obviously, or the features that the languages provide, but like there are differences like across many different languages. So I believe they're quite irrelevant here. But the main difference I would say in this case is that uh, as long as they're statically tight and actually TypeScript is um, like formally, uh, it's a mixed, <laughs> uh, it's it's a mixed type. So it's not dynamically, it's not static, it's, it's, it, it falls to a, a different uh, category. It's called gradually typed. That's kind of because uh, we still have any in TypeScript, so that is dynamic, and that is kind of kind of well not statically checked, That's because any basically goes like beyond any static type checks. But the big difference is that um, Java and C Sharp uh, pay attention to where does your interface or class come from. So what does it implement or what does it inherit? So if you try to visualize a graph where you have the uh, dependencies of certain uh, of certain interfaces and uh, and class, and you think that okay, this class is ex is an extension of a, uh, of a superclass, and the superclass is uh, implementing a super interface, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, the whole polymorphism behind these statically typed languages like Java and C Sharp basically boils down to the fact that when I expect a super type, something more general, and I pass you something more specific, the question is, is it included in your inheritance chain? That's the thing. So this is called nominal typing. So I care about where do you come from? And as I mentioned before, TypeScript doesn't care at this at all. Um, so if you create two... Uh, interfaces, uh, objects, uh, like, you know, the just the runtime objects, the types or classes or whatever, TypeScript doesn't care whether they share anything in their inheritance chain or, you know, implementation chain. Uh, the only thing that TypeScript cares about is actually your structure. So think, like, try to think of an interface or a type or a class as if it was a contract. Like, you as an employee come to a you know company and you sign up a contract and it, the contract would basically state point number one this is what you are expected to do point number two this is what you're expected to do point number three this is what you're expected to have so you might have properties or you might be doing some methods so that's basically just a list of requirements 
And dear everybody, think of objects as basically contracts, like very small contracts, list of requirements, and structural typing, which TypeScript implements, is basically um, focusing on what is the contract, what are the requirements, and the fact that like two completely unrelated companies uh, working in completely different uh, countries or even different industries might have the same shape of the contract, right? What the problem? Like, there is no problem. But as long as you have, you know, the same contract, you're basically compatible. So all in all, um, the, the, the the thing when it comes to uh, to uh, backend developers who, uh, who sh what they should be aware is that when you create similar interfaces, types, or classes, if they share the same structure, they are going to be compatible. So copy pasting, you know, types with just different things is, is, is it will lead you nowhere most probably. So, uh, there are many more uh, differences, but I would say this is the, the key one. Can you explain the concept of structural typing in TypeScript? Above to what I, what I already said, like, so the thing that, that we should leverage actually is that we can use the fact that TypeScript relies on the structure of your contract. So. Uh, when, let's say, you expect that there would be an object which has, I don't know, A number and B boolean, and you pass something that will have, I don't know, four properties or 100 properties, but the two are there, this is going to com be compatible. But on the other hand, and this is a foundation for uh, a pattern that is called brand types or opac types, uh, just a different name for that, is basically when you create a property that you're very unlikely to have, you will make a thing that used to be compatible now incompatible if you want it. So what Brent and Obach types basically do is that you can provide a very specific type of a number or a very specific type of a string so that by modifying the structure, you can make something compatible or incompatible d depending on what you want. So what I said before uh, at the very beginning of, the, of, the, of our uh, conversation is that people do not do not realize that they have very powerful tools and you can actually kind of configure your type compatibility by using the, the structural uh, nature of, of, of TypeScript's uh, type system. So all in all, by uh, providing, by introducing custom properties, you can basically, you know, increase or decrease the type compatibility, which is which is absolutely phenomenal and more and more languages, like I mean, the uh, the the mainstream languages like Java and C sharp, uh, they are heading towards the same direction as well. But as you can imagine, they will it will take time unless they get uh, uh, unless they get there. Uh, and moreover, the algebraic data types such as you know unions and intersections, they are uh, going to land in the mainstream other mainstream languages as well. TypeScript is probably like it's difficult to measure, but it's probably the first mainstream language that proved that, oh yeah, uh, algebraic data types are actually something very, very, uh, very useful. By the way, unions and intersections, they all, you know, rely on structural typing anyway. They're just some kind of, you know, uh, something you could work out from the, from the whole concept that you have a structure, which is basically a contract, like a list of requirements that you have to, that you have to meet. People say that TypeScript has a powerful type system, but it also support type assertions, which you mentioned as a primary concern. When should one use type assertions and what are the potential risks? Yeah, I mentioned that people overuse type assertions and that it is a major issue because people want TypeScript to agree with what they write. And that's basically, it should be the other way around. We should write something that TypeScript will agree with, right? So type assertion is the way to kind of tell TypeScript that, oh, well, dear TypeScript, you, you cannot know a thing, like you don't have enough knowledge, so I'm going to provide you more knowledge because you, for instance, you couldn't figure out that the document dot get element by ID is actually not just an unknown HTML element, but it's an HTML input element. So TypeScript just cannot figure out some of the things in our code base. But, um, or for instance, another example, when you click a 
element uh, like a button in your uh, in your front end application uh, and you call an all click uh, handler and you know that it relates to an element that is within an array that the element you clicked relates to an object which has to be within the array because if it was not within the array then uh, the element would basically not be shown and the let's say button couldn't be clicked because it would not be there and when TypeScript runs the code and you do the array.find function, uh, the array.find returns either the T element or undefined. And the thing is, TypeScript will tell you, hey, like find theoretically might not find the, the find method might not find the element. So we put the exclamation mark, which is the not null assertion. So we're like providing more insight to TypeScript, which basically TypeScript cannot figure out because it doesn't know how does the application look, what is the DOM structure of our application, etc. So these are kind of okay-ish uh, use cases for us. But what I see very often is that you have, let's say, a super type, which is, let's say, human, and people cast it down, like downcast it to, a, let's say, developer, a subtype, something more specific, and they're kind of happy with it. And that's a problem <laughs> because um, it doesn't come from the, you know, from the, this knowledge doesn't come from a visual layer. It doesn't come from um, any kind of, you know, flow that you've got in your application. It doesn't come from the DOM, log, uh, DOM structure, etc. It just comes from the fact that your model is poorly designed and you might have, let's say, a human that is a baker, a human that is a taxi driver, or a human that is a developer, but for some reason, TypeScript couldn't figure out that right here, right now, is just a developer. So if you're saying, hey, TypeScript, treat the human as a developer, like you have a hole, you have, you know, like flaky design, so you should fix this first. And when we do the type assertion, the ask keyword, we can actually upcast or downcast. We can never cast a site. Because, like, you know, uh, typecasting number as string, fortunately, is forbidden because, like, TypeScript would throw an error that neither type overlaps with the other because, like, no number could be a string and no string could be a number, so it doesn't make sense. Thankfully, it's forbidden. But if we have, um, let's say, uh, we can cast a human to a developer, which is basically downcasting because from something more general, we cast it to, down to something more specific, to a, to a subtype. And we cast, we can cast a uh, subtype, a developer, upcast it to a super type, which is a human. And the thing is, if I have a developer, could it be that a developer is not a human since we are upcasting it? Well, no, because it couldn't be like a developer is a special, let's say, instance of a, or a special type of a human. So it has to be a human at the same time. But it's not, so upcasting is always safe because we can never be wrong with it. But downcasting uh, is not safe. And the thing is, when I see ass in the code bases and I ask people like, why are you doing it? Uh, and do you know what is actually going on there? And the fact that you could like remodel your thing so that you wouldn't have to use the ass at all. For instance, if, be, if you've been using unions and tile guards and people do not even think in terms of what is a super type, what is a stop type. The only thing that people uh, people think of is that the compiler, like again, majority of the people probably, so people are aware of that, but like I've seen that just too often. Um, just the compiler throws an error. So I will basically use the type assertion. No, that leads nowhere. So, uh, you should be thinking like, okay, if you know that in runtime, a certain property is going to be available here, cool. But what is the reason that TypeScript cannot figure it out? Like help it, help TypeScript to figure it out automatically. Because if you're doing the ass, you're kind of misleading TypeScript to some knowledge. And the thing is, you might be right today, right here, right now, but what if your code changes after half year or a year or two years and your type assertion won't be true and the problem is since you're telling typescript that hey shut up i know better than you then the typescript is not do not going to re-evaluate the the type check for you that's the problem so don't think in terms of what you've got today and you know like uh 
disable the errors today, but think of the changes that could um, apply to your code base. The same that, That's basically the same rule when people, uh, for instance, turn off linter checks, for instance, um, when using uh, exhaustiveness uh, checks in React dependencies. Like the, the, the most critical rules are there not to disable the tool. They are here to help us. And if we disable them, they're going to be disabled not only today, but also for all the future changes. And that's that's the, the, the main issue. So um, when it comes to type assertions, I would say that we should do all that we can to remodel our, uh, <laughs> like provide a different model, provide a different design so that TypeScript could figure out something very often using unions and uh, type guards is going to be like enough. Not always, but very often. You also mentioned concerns regarding how people utilize generics. What exactly are generics in TypeScript? Uh, generics work quite similar as they do in Java, C Sharp, or C++, and, and other uh, statically typed languages. So they basically provide some kind of a template that your function or a method call or your structure definition could be used in different contexts. For instance, when you've got an array, you don't define that this is going to be an array of a certain uh, types of values, but it could be an array of, and here you put what is going to be the, the type of the value. So the definition of an array um, concentrates on what operations you can do, but you can basically parameterize uh, when you map, what are you going to map from and what are you going to map to? Uh, if you reduce, you know what are you going like uh, you know how to do the reduce array uh, the array knows how to how to how to reduce or write reduce things. but it's not bound to a very specific type so we can parameterize them. like the whole idea of generics is basically to parameterize uh, either the flow or the data structures. By the way, some people say that there are no like, nothing like a generic concept in TypeScript, but there are basically type parameters. And actually, when you take a look at uh, TypeScript error messages, uh, pretty often you will see that like type parameters are required or type parameters are incompatible, etc. So this basically, you can think of uh, generics uh, generate uh, like type parameters the same way, and that's the mental model that, that helps me uh, to think about it, uh, to think the same way as you have a function which has parameters. So you pass the arguments to a function and you can call this function multiple times with different uh, arguments. And that's going to do a similar logic, just that the, the ingredients are going to be different. So generics are a very similar, uh, a, a very similar concept with a very similar usage. So you're going to use a type or a method call, etc., uh, to pass what are the uh, what are the type parameters there. So you might get a different result, different structure, etc. But the whole mechanism inside is going to be uh, to be similar. Um, so they can increase the reusability of code because, um, well. You can basically write less code that would be more flexible because, uh, for instance, whenever you call a uh, generic method or generic function for each call is going to fill in, like evaluate what are going to resolve uh, different uh, type parameters for each call. Uh, moreover, um, how can they improve type safety? So imagine you have a function where and let's say you do a plus operator. Plus operator uh, makes sense when you uh, add numbers or when you concatenate, uh, concatenate strings. Maybe there are more use cases for plus, but let's stick to these, uh, these two. And let's say that you want to provide a function that would basically do the thing either for two strings or two numbers. So what I see pretty often is that people put, okay, so I'm going to have function add that will have A and B, both are string or numbers, like the union of string and number. And that's kind of not true, because if you have A, string or number, and B, string or number, it basically means that you could, ha you could have A, which is a string, and B, which is a number. And that doesn't make sense, right, uh, in our case, because that's not neither concatenation nor 
just addition of two numbers. Like I'm putting coercion aside, which is a a, a different topic, a different issue. But uh, that's a good use case for generic. So it's not always a situation where you just put that, okay, I've got a T, but also we could uh, limit ourselves. And that's a very important aspect uh, many people are missing is the use of generic constraints. So basically in the triangular braces, we don't just only write the T or whatever other letter we provide, but the T extends, for instance, in this case, string or number. So that when we've got A of type T and B of type T, and that extends, extends string or a number, then uh, if we provide one string, the other one has to be string as well. If we provide a number, the other one would have to be a number as well. So that's basically uh, the most important thing here is the right and uh, the conscious use of generic constraint. This is how we can uh, improve uh, type safety. Moreover, uh, there is one more aspect that I have already mentioned uh, when speaking about the type assertions, that it's always safe to upcast from a subtype to a supertype, uh, but uh, it's not the true, uh, the other way around, some uh, downcasting from a supertype to a subtype. Uh, you're go it's going to be way easier for uh, for for us so if we try to think about the relations between the types so what is a super type and what is a subtype and actually when we take a look at the generic constraint that says for instance t extends string or number what people often think is that the extends uh, keyword comes from object oriented programming that you could have let's say a very general human interface or an object and the class that would basically implement this interface so extends basically means subclassing or implementing a class but you could think like what the heck does it mean um, that type t extends string or number when string or number is not even uh, you know, it's not even an object. So, like, what is this? So, um, this is kind of, you know, a kind of syntactic limitation that um, TypeScript authors probably wanted just to use a word that is basically commonly known in other languages and, you know, not to introduce too many uh, keywords, just not to make the, the syntax uh, too complex. But uh, the mental model that I build uh, for myself is to think about the extent, extents keyword as is subtype of. So if I have something like T is a subtype of string or number, then it basically means it could be a string, it could be a number, or it could be something that is a, just a sub string or a sub number or something more limited. And it makes well, way more sense because being a subtype actually means being a subclass or a sub interface, a subtype or a substructure. Uh, so it still holds, but it also makes a lot of sense uh, when it comes to primitives. So uh, another topic that, that 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 people just you know kind of discover, figure out is that the same type compatibility rules apply to both objects and primitives. So primitives do not have you know their own completely different, unknown you know undiscovered uh, mechanics. No, they do have basically. Like 90% of what going on, what's going on in TypeScript is basically uh, the rules to that go to, like you could assign an expression of a subtype to an expected supertype, but not the other way around. And this is like the relations between the supertypes and the subtypes is going to be, you know, like 90% of, of all we've got in, in, in TypeScript. So uh, making it like, how can we um, improve type safety when it comes to generics? Using generic constraints, understanding how they work, understanding the concept of the relations between uh, types like the subtypes and supertypes. Uh, yeah, like quite often when you provide something generic and you might, for instance, you would like to have a generic component in, uh, in one or other framework, let it be React, Angular, whatever that is, and you would like to have a generic um, props or inputs, etc. you might need also to uplift the generic to the component level itself. And for instance, in, in React, uh, when we've got a generic uh, interface, you might we might also need to make the function component 
being a generic as well, but that's basically just a consequence of 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 how uh, generics work. So, generic constraints for the win. TypeScript introduced the unknown type. How does it differ from any? When should you prefer one over the other? If you think in terms of su- subtypes and supertypes, you can think of um, like, okay, what is the like most sub 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 type that, that, that cannot be even further a subtype? And the same way, what is the most gen- general, you know, less the least specific type? If you walk into super 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 type, so what is the uh, what is the floor and what is the seal of the entire type system? And any is a pop type. You could think of it as a seal that you can basically never go above it. So it's so general, like it has so little knowledge that we actually don't know what it is. So it's called unknown. And the thing is, um, I try to th- like I like to think of unknown as the universe. So it could be everything, like absolutely everything. And you could like. Uh, there might be a question like, okay, so but any it actually anything. So what is unknown? So the thing is, they're both anything. They're both everything. Like uh, so, everything basically could be put there. But the thing is, imagine let's say you are standing outside and there is a meteor that basically a small meteor that basically hits the Earth and it just hits the Earth just right right in front of you and you see, okay, there is a so matter, some some rock that basically fell from the sky, and you're figuring like, what could I do with it safely? We don't know whether it's some kind of liquid. We don't know whether it's metal, whether it's you know radioactive. So what could we, how could we safely use the thing that fell from the sky? And you have like absolutely no idea what that is. So how could we use it safely? We cannot use it safely unless we do some research, like. Whether we, until we find out what is the thing. And that's basically the whole point of using unknown. So when you deal with something that you, like, it could be absolutely anything, there is no safe way to use it unless you verify what that is. So uh, the whole point of using unknown is to force the developers to use type guards. So unless you check what that is, you cannot use it. And the type guard is certainly a function uh, that is basically depending on whether a condition is true or not. It's going to narrow down the knowledge about a, a, a type to make it more specific to ha- to gather more knowledge about the type, or will basically keep to uh, remain or stick to, for instance, unknown uh, like the original unchanged uh, if the condition is is not met. What is the difference with any? Um, so, please think of unknown as just an ordinary type. A normal type that conforms to all the mm, standard rules in TypeScript. So, if we have uh, type compatibility rules that apply to strings, numbers, objects, functions, etc., unknown is with them. It just co- it it has to conform to all the rules. It is any which is different. So, when you take a look at the compiler. Uh, the TypeScript compiler, which is basically a funny file that has something like 50 or 60,000 lines of code, the type checker itself, just one enormous file. <laughs> it's a funny adventure to, to, to go through the compiler code base. Um, you will see that each expression has some information about the type and basically any is one of them. So if you're a, if an expression is any, then in many, many places in the compiler, you're just going to have an if statement saying that if you're any, we just pass you through. Just walk walk forward. Like you walk to the airport and you need to go through the security gates. Imagine any comes at the airport and it just and it doesn't come through the go through the security gate. It just goes aside with no checks. Just you're always welcome. Whatever you do, whatever you are, you're not going to be checked in the compiler in many, many places. So unknown is just an unknown nicely fits into the whole picture so that if something is very, very general, it means we have no knowledge about it. We got no idea what that is. How can we use it safely? We cannot unless we check it. And that's kind of normal. That's natural. And any is, we don't know what it is, but everybody will pretend that you're okay without any checks. 
So this is the, I would say, destructive one. So they're both top types, but unknown is the normal one and any is the, let's say, um, <laughs> we have a funny saying in Polish that to be a friend of a rabbit means that, uh, you know, you just get things for granted even if you don't deserve it. So any doesn't deserve basically passing all the things, but they're just not checked. So, uh, so yeah, and pretty often when people overuse any, the first thing that I would say is that, uh, the, the point number one, uh, try to think whether replacing any with a generic, with a simple generic could be, could do that trick. And the second thing, if you really don't know what the thing is, put unknown, uh, because by the way, what can you put where unknown is expected? Everything. What can you put when any is expected? Also everything. So they don't change in this regard. But if you want to actually, not to put, but to use something, not to put, but to consume, then can you uh, consume any everywhere? Yes. Where can you use unknown? Nowhere, unless you find it. Of course, like apart, except for uh, when you want to put an unknown in where unknown is expected, but that's an extreme edge case. But uh, you can use any everywhere and you can use unknown nowhere until you check it because that's the whole point. So uh, a small a small sad thing is that it would be uh, marvelous if TypeScript started having unknown from the very beginning. But unfortunately, as you can imagine, like, you know, TypeScript evolves and introduces many other uh, features that we don't have or we have uh, they have introduced very recently so it's evolving all the time and maybe we will talk more about the uh, additional features to TypeScript uh, more uh, oh, because I can spoil that we're going to have the second part of our of our podcast um, related to TypeScript as well so maybe we can dive deeper there um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's the point of, uh, of unknown basically to be the type safe version of any. And just to mention to everybody, um, unknown is there for, to be used with time guards and more, uh, more often than not, you should have quite a lot of time guards in your project because that's the whole point of, you know, introducing type safety into your, into your project. In less than two weeks, just before NG and JS Poland conferences, you will be leading the Mastering TypeScript Advanced Patterns for the Hardcore Development Masterclass Workshop. What does the term Hardcore Development mean to you personally in context of this workshop? Something that I see when people write in TypeScript is that they try to do something well. Uh, advanced or something that would basically meet multiple requirements. They just need to get something done, which is sometimes it's easy, but sometimes it's not. And we were talking about the, the, the second thing. And everything is cool until they get a very nasty TypeScript compilation error. Or when they want TypeScript uh, type inference to figure out what the, what the calculated type is going to be, it's completely different than what they expected or what they wanted. And the only thing that comes to their mind is to put an S, which is, as I mean, like the type assertion, uh, which is basically brute forcing the, the, the compiler. So what is the uh, what do I mean by hardcore? It's basically getting a really, really deep understanding of what are the key mechanics when it comes to, you know, combining map types, conditional types, generics with generic constraints, um, with key remapping and, uh, you know, like deep recursive structures, etc., etc. So like we're going to uh, uh, do quite a bit of, uh, well, I would say really difficult exercises that we will get to know what, like how to think and how to think in a way that the compiler thinks inter inter interlay, maybe not words, but uh, not things, but how does it work? So what are the rules? Um, for instance, when you have a conditional type, the union is going to be distributed, etc. And basing on a certain like um, concern, just like this one, we get a whole bunch of different like patterns that if you don't know about them, you're completely lost. And if you want to achieve a certain you know objective, a certain requirement, this is the way to do it. And uh, like what 
what we are going to do during this workshop is basically getting to know the very details of a certain, you know, types of errors and basically how to get the job done. Because like the whole point of providing type safety is actually to understanding um, when or why is TypeScript throwing an error. Like this is the the very first point. So I like to start with the TypeScript errors to figure out what should be done in this case. And actually, if TypeScript throws an errors, then you know which mistakes you can prevent. So so by hardcore development, I mean going really deep into very specific aspects of how to provide type safety. Could you share what participants can learn from this workshop? Participants will learn a lot of the low-level details when it comes to type compatibility across different uh, types. Uh, they will learn many good and bad practices when it comes to applying unions and intersections in large-scale projects. They will learn how widely should a certain type be used among a project or like what should be more publicly available, what should be more local. Uh, they will learn uh, many uh, techniques, as I mentioned, for instance, the distributiveness of unions and like when can it help us when when it can uh, when it can like introduce some limitation uh, like how can we make uh, actual use of it and I don't think that everybody in a certain project should be like that like have such really really uh, advanced knowledge or even expert knowledge but I believe that if you are running a TypeScript project or a product. I believe there should be at least one person, which is a really hardcore developer in this context, because, um, well, if you don't have per a person that will be able to fix uh, a, a compilation error the right way, you're going to end up with as any or as something, as something, as something. That, and that's basically lying, uh, lying to the compiler. It's basically, you know, tricks that will kick you in the long run. Could you share some success stories or experiences from participants who have taken your workshop and they apply what they've learned to their own development projects? Something that I uh, hear like straight during the, the trainings or the workshops, like as, as we go, is people, you know, open their eyes widely and I ask like what 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 what's happening? Like what's wrong? And they say, Oh damn, I have to I have to refactor my entire project from scratch because I, I, I have been using a thing that I should not have been using because I was not aware of something. So uh they very often uh figure out that oops, we need to completely change the way we think, or that uh there are some misconceptions like you know everybody can write a blog blog in in on an internet and uh you know when you read about a new feature or a kind of technique like you know you build trust uh, you trust some authors more you trust some authors le uh, less but actually there are quite a bit of developers who basically read what is out there in the internet and like the more experienced you are, the more you can evaluate whether a practice is actually a good practice or a bad practice, or that it's contextual, that sometimes it makes a lot of sense and sometimes less, but less experienced people, uh, they might not have enough knowledge to evaluate whether a practice is good or not, and they just apply it. And the problem is that when they apply a practice that they've been told that is a good idea, then after some time it could turn out, oh, no, in the long run, it's not. So um, the, 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 the success stories is basically <laughs> um, when I like kind of pretty much all my consultancy work, uh, like some of them relate to performance, some other relate to uh to uh architecture especially micro frontends but all of them relate more or less to typescript and uh pretty much in each place there is something that you could fix uh or to 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 make it more type safe and again that's an investment so uh just designing your your model uh in a better way is basically going to uh, make it more readable for other folks who are going to join your project and uh, th th that's one thing. So, you know, a long-term investment, but also, um, as I mentioned, uh, people immediately saw like, oh shit, we've been doing the, the whole thing like 
not very not not right from the from the early uh from the early beginning and you know like if you're if you think that just using types and interfaces in your project is enough like you should you should just join the workshop now it's time for our quick choices segment where i ask you a few fun questions and you can quickly respond by choosing between option a or b Star Wars or Lord of the Rings? Neither. Pink or blue? Blue. Metallica or Samantha Fox? Metallica, definitely. Listen to the podcast or listen to the podcast? Listen to the podcast. <laughs> New book or audiobook? Audiobook. Tomek, thank you so much for joining us today. Your insight and expertise have been invaluable. We truly appreciate your time and contribution to our podcast. Thank you very much, and thank you to all the listeners of your podcast. So thank you, Dag. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you all for tuning into today's episode. If you found our conversation insightful and wish to continue being a part of our journey, please consider subscribing to our podcast. By doing so, you won't miss out on any upcoming episodes, and it helps us continue to bring you meaningful content. Remember, every subscription, like or share truly make a difference. Until next time, stay curious and keep listening. Mm-hmm.